Hi everyone, welcome to Limits. You'll notice that some of the notes are already filled in. In the last video, I actually made all the graphs. So you're welcome to um, check your graphs if you skipped that video and just make sure you actually have all the graphs correct. But we're actually gonna jump into Limits now. So this is new, this is really a foundation to calculus, so it's important that you understand it. Um, it has a weird notation, but I'm gonna write one out for you. We just write L-I-M, but we still pronounce it limit. We never say limb. And this means as X approaches, we pronounce that arrow approaches two. And if I put a little negative sign, then you're approaching from the negative side of the graph. If I say the limit as X approaches two from the right, from the positive side of the graph, um, and if I say just X approaches to in general, then it's not from a specific side. So there's three different ways to write the limit. And in this case, we want to know the limit as X approaches to of the function. So F of X is the function of the function two X plus one. So literally I'm trying to reach the X value two but not necessarily at two, just anywhere along this line. So I'm gonna draw, there's not really an asymptote here, I'm just gonna draw a dotted line. All of those spots are where X is equal to two. So I'm over here, I'm on the left-hand side, and I'm gonna be on my graph, and I'm gonna keep following my graph, and I'm approaching two. What does the Y value end up being? Five. I know this is gonna seem really dumb. It's just, you're literally saying, as I'm following this graph, what do I expect the Y value to be? All a limit is, is an expected Y value. That's how you can think of it. As I'm approaching two from the right, so here's the right-hand side of the graph, so I find my graph on the right, I'm coming in, I'm almost at X is equal to two, and I'm still at five. So 2x plus 1, the limit, this is pronounced, the limit as x approaches 2 from the right of 2x plus 1 is equal to 5. Now, here's the thing. As long as the left-hand limit and the right-hand limit match, then you can just say the limit. You don't have to say from the left or from the right. So the limit of 2x plus 1 as x approaches 2 from either direction is five. That is the answer. In other words, it's just the y value. So let's do another one. The limit as x approaches zero from the left of, I'm just going to write f of x because that's easier to write than x squared minus 2x plus 1. So as I'm approaching zero, so I'm trying to get to zero, which is over here anywhere on this line. I'm gonna make a squiggly so you don't think that it has to be an asymptote. But that's the line x is equal to zero. You're looking for the y coordinate, the expected y value. So I'm coming in from the left, looks like I'm gonna to go to one. I did, I went to one. That's what I expected to do. I come in from the right, the limit as x approaches zero from the right of f of x. I'm coming in from the right, I'm coming in. I went down, but now I'm coming back up. I'm definitely going to reach one. And because the two limits match, you can just say as X approaches zero, the limit of F of X is one. You don't need to have a left-hand limit and a right-hand limit. Obviously, we're going to do those, just not yet. We're just trying to get you used to this so far. Okay. Okay. So now I'm trying to approach two. Like I said, if it helps you, then you could sit there and make a little mark at two. So two would be anywhere along this line. Again, as I'm approaching from the left, right? What does it look like it's gonna hit? As I'm approaching from the right, what does it look like I'm gonna hit? Well, on this one, it's not so obvious, but that's okay because it's just the y value. So you can find the y value. At two, you get five. 
over four. Now, we're not gonna keep writing that whole limit thing, but from the left, it's approaching five-fourths. From the right, it's approaching five-fourths, which means the answer is five-fourths. Now, this is gonna seem a little tedious as we just get through this, but I need you to understand that a lot of the time, the limit is just the Y value because usually what you're approaching, you actually reach. Now we're approaching three pi halves, which is here. So I'm starting from the left, I'm coming in, I go up, I go down, down, up. What do I end up hitting? It looks like I'm going to hit negative one. From the right, I'm gonna hit negative one. And since they match, the limit is negative one. I hope you're saying, this is so easy because at this point it, it should be fairly easy. All right. Okay. All right. So on this next one, it's a little bit different. This is where people sometimes get confused and that's because there's a hole there. So if you weren't here for the graphing video, the hole is there because X can't actually be equal to five there. Um, that would create a zero in the denominator, but still, as you're approaching from the left, this imaginary line where x is equal to five, remember it's not an asymptote, I'm just telling you, I'm trying to get to this line. As x approaches five, it clearly has a y value of 10. And even if you come in from the other direction, it clearly has a y value of 10. And because those two match, I can say that the limit of x squared minus 25 over x minus five, as x approaches five, is 10. Because a limit is just what you're approaching. Even if there's a hole there, that's actually the whole purpose of limits. It's limits were created to sit there and say, okay, I know it's not actually 10 because that would create a hole, blah, 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 but it's definitely supposed to be 10. So that's sometimes how I think about it which is why I'm making my own videos because I'm sure that it's not the most mathematically correct way of explaining it, but I, I hope that it helps you understand what's happening. Now, we're back to a continuous graph. Here's a little clue in case you haven't made this connection yet, that whenever you have a continuous graph, you're always going to have a limit because it's continuous. So we're trying to get to X is negative five I'm going to draw a little line there. This is the line x is equal to negative 5. Now, I can't see the graph from the left, but I, I know it's there, and I know it's going to 2. From the right, I'm coming in on my graph. I'm following my graph. I'm trying to get to the green line. And what's the expected y value? 2. And uh, because they match, it's going to be 2. Hopefully this is making some sense for you. Good, next one. Um, again, if you weren't here for the graphing, we were able to simplify this. So it looks like a pretty complicated problem, but it's actually just y is equal to one over x plus one. And you can use that reduced form in your limit. So I'm trying to figure out the limit as x approaches one. So when x approaches 1 from the left, it's somewhere around there. I didn't make a very accurate graph. And as x approaches 1 from this side, it's still going to be that point. Now, because I didn't make an accurate graph, it actually doesn't give me the true answer. It looks like it's maybe 0.7 or 0.8. So you should always be actually calculating the function. If you actually put a 1 in here, you get 1 half. I'm just going to call it the function y rather than writing out this entire long function. You actually get one half from both directions. Okay. So a more interesting point would have been if I had asked you for the limit. Um, that didn't want to write very nicely. If I had asked you for the limit of y of this function as x approaches 5 because 5 has a hole in it but actually that doesn't matter holes don't matter 
as long as what you're doing from the left matches what you're doing from the right and they both are approaching the same number, the limit still works. So the limit from the left, and I can't tell what that number is. The graph isn't that helpful, but plugging it in, I would get one sixth. As I come in from the right, the limit of this function as x approaches five from the right would be one sixth. So you don't need a left and a right because they match. You can just say the limit as x approaches five of this function y is equal to x minus five over x squared minus four x minus five. See, it's a mouthful. We're not going to write it all the way out. Is one six. Okay. So five was a more interesting point, and yet it had the same results. Even more interesting point would be, what if I asked you, what is the limit as x approaches negative one? Okay, and I'm going to switch it to f of x this time, just because I can. Y and f of x mean the same thing. This is where it would have been really interesting. And now they don't have the same answer. As I'm approaching negative one from the left, what is the expected y value? What do I think it's going to do? Well, I can see graphically, it's just going to go down, down, down. It's negative infinity from the left. But look, as I approach negative one from the right, what does it do? I'm coming in from the right and I'm approaching negative one. I'm going in from the right and look what it does. It goes up to positive infinity. Do they match? They don't. So under, under the last column where it says, well, then what is just the limit as X approaches one, negative one in general, it doesn't have an answer. So we write that it does not exist. There is no limit. And in our usual mathematical, slightly lazy fashion, people write DNA. It does not exist. So anyway, you really only need the, um, <laughs> the green set here. This is what the question was asking, but trying to expand and give you a little sense of where we're going with this. All right, cosine, we're just looking at the green one. The blue one was there to show you the parent graph. Um, as we're approaching pi, so here's pi. I'm going to make a little line on pi. Back to its simplest terms. The limit means what is the expected y value. So as I'm approaching from the left, I expect it to be 3. As I'm approaching from the right, I expect it to be 3. And since they match, the limit is 3. On the next one, I'm approaching 2. As I come in from the left, uh, if you can't figure it out, on this one, the graph was perfect. If you don't know it, actually plot the point. At 2, it's negative 2 squared, so negative 4 thirds. And because it's a continuous function, it doesn't matter if you come in from the left or come in from the right. The limit's going to be the same for all of them. Okay, take a look at the last one. As x approaches zero, so the limit of f of x, as x approaches zero from the left, I'm approaching zero from the left, it goes down to negative infinity. But the limit as x approaches zero from the right is equal to, I'm coming in from the right, I'm approaching zero, here's my zero mark. I'm approaching zero, it goes to positive infinity. So we would say that the limit as x approaches zero of f of x does not exist. Now, believe it or not, we're actually going to spend a whole nother class just on, on limits that don't exist and infinity. Um, that's just like a little sneak peek so that you didn't think it was always as simple as three, three, three and negative four thirds, negative four thirds, negative four thirds. Um, what we're going to do today is focus on piecewise functions that have some different limits. But before that, um, in simplest terms, 
the limit is the expected y value. So when you see the question, what is the limit of the function x squared plus 1 as x approaches 3, which will be written like this, that's how you would say it, the question is really asking what is the expected y value of x squared plus 1 when x is equal to 3. That's how you can think of it. All right. So all year, I'm always going to try and explain things in the simplest possible way. But then I'm also going to show you the fancy mathematical way. Because if you take calculus in college next year, you have to be able to read a textbook and follow a professor that probably isn't going to talk the same way I do. Um, I'm just trying to make it very relatable for you. And, um, you know, they've got PhDs in math. They're going to say things in really awesome ways. Um, but this is how it would be written in a mathematical book. A function has a limit as x approaches c if and only if, which you'll see abbreviated IFF, the right-hand limit and the left-hand limit at point c exist and are the same. So now that I've explained it, I think that you'll, you'll actually get this. If the limit as x approaches c from the left of ffx is equal to l, and the limit as x approaches c from the right of f of x is equal to l, then the limit of f of x as x approaches c just in general without a left or a right is equal to l. And the note that you might want to write on your paper is that if the left limit matches the right limit, then the limit exists. Okay, so there are three different cases that you need to be aware of. The easiest one is any continuous function. You guys have a continuous function. You're going to have a limit. It doesn't matter where I ask you to go. A non-continuous function, something with a hole in it, also has a limit. As you're coming in from the left and you're coming in from the right, it doesn't matter. It still has a limit. And then finally, if you have a non-continuous function and it's defined at a different point, believe it or not, that limit also still exists. So it's your expected y value. So if you're coming in and you think you're going to hit this point and then it actually is up there, we don't care. Okay. All three of these the limit exists and there's not a problem. It doesn't matter if it's continuous or if there's a hole or if there's actually a hole with another point. All three of these are good. So um, that tends to be a little confusing. So we'll do some examples, but at least now you have it in your notes for the three different cases. All right, graphing piecewise functions, everybody's favorite. So the first one, first of all, if we were in class, I would actually just sit there and say, everybody turn to your group and graph the piecewise function. I would not be doing this for you. This is the one thing that we'll have to be figuring out. Um, sorry, I got a little message here on the computer. Um, so this is something that we'll have to be figuring out is how to you know, make you guys do this. You might want to pause it and see if you can do it and then skip ahead in the video. That would probably be the best thing. But sorry, I know there's some of you that are just going to watch me do it. Um, that really won't help you as much. I cannot stress enough that you really should try to graph this, especially if you're in AP. Try to graph this on your own and then go forward and see if you did it correctly. Um, all right. The first one is a line. You can put a little y is equal to in front of each of them, and then it will make your life easier. So it's just a line. They wrote it backwards just to be tricky, but if it helps you, you can rewrite it as y is equal to negative 2x plus 2, and that'll put you more in your comfort zone. Starts at 2, and it goes down to over 1. Now be careful, it actually is just that long. It only is going from 0 to 1, so I'm already going to stop. I put an open circle at the 1 because of the parenthesis. Parenthesis means open, bracket means closed. 
second one you can think of again as y is equal to y is equal to negative x minus 3 squared plus 2. Um, it is going to be a parabola, and it has been moved to the right 3 and up 2. The right 3 and up 2. So I'm going to put the vertex right there. Now, before I just start plotting points enthusiastically, I usually plot the endpoints to make sure I don't graph too much. So I know I only want to go to 2. So since this just has an a of negative 1, it's going to go um, over 1, down 1, and that's going to be a solid. But I, I don't want to keep going over 2 and down 4 like I normally would. I just want to go that far. I do want to go in the other direction now to the 4, um, but I'm going to make an open circle. So for those of you that are used to doing you know, over one, down one, and over two, down four. Just be careful that you're watching your endpoints. Okay, next one is y is equal to negative one. Now, normally, this one's really confusing for kids. Normally, y is equal to negative one would be a horizontal line at the point negative one, like that. But this is just at the x is equal to four. So instead of a whole line, it's literally just going to be a dot. At 4, it's negative 1, right there. And the last one is a line. y is equal to x minus 4, and it's just a line between 4 and 5. So in this case, it does not pay to start at your y-intercept of negative 4, which I can't even see, and then go up 1 over 1. I would just plot the two points. At 4, if you plug it in, it's going to be 0. And at 5, it's going to be 1. This is going to be solid because of the bracket. And this is going to be open because of the parenthesis. So 4, 0 is open, and 5, 1 is solid. Here's my super funky looking graph. You'll notice that both of these are open and this one's closed. You can't have more than one solid point at any one point or it doesn't pass the vertical line test. Okay, so I was about to say we're going to do limits, but actually let's just do all the function values. So remember, this just means the y value. We've been doing this for years. f of 0 is 2. Again, you should probably pause the video and see if you can fill in all the function values yourself and then turn it back on, um, but I will go through them f of 1 is 0. Actually, that's not true. It's an open circle, isn't it? So it does not exist. There's nothing there. Okay. Um, f of 2 is 1. f of 3 is 2. f of 4, so its actual function value, is negative 1 has open circles, but they don't matter, just like it didn't matter on this one, right? And f of 5 is 1. Those are just your y values. Don't, don't overthink it, just your y values. Now, and I only filled in the first one with all its fancy limit stuff. The limit as x approaches 0 from the left. No. You can't approach from the left. There is no graph from the left. So that's going to be does not exist. But I can approach it from the right. So as it x approaches 0 from the right, so again, if it helps you, you could make the squiggly line. I'm not going to do it. It'll get all cluttered. But as I'm approaching 0 from the right, what is my expected y value? Where am I traveling to? It looks like I'm going to hit 2. So I write 2. Do they match? No. So there's no... There's no limit just as x approaches 0, only from the left or from the right. Now, again, you're going to hear me say this a lot all year. Your best bet right now would be to stop this video and see if you can fill in the rest of the limits. I would certainly, if you were in school, ask you to turn to your group and fill it in, and I'd be walking around and answering questions. Um, but as we all know, we're doing things a little differently this year. So... Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and, and do them for you. I am going to write the next limit just to let you practice that. The limit of f of x 
you definitely want to write f of x here. It's a giant piecewise function. As x approaches 1 from the left. So I'm, I'm approaching x is equal to 1. I'm coming in. What does I expect the y value to be? I expect it to be 0. It doesn't actually hit 0, but that doesn't matter. It's just, it's kind of like a direction. What do I think it's heading to? Now, the limit as x approaches 1 from the right actually does not exist. There is nothing. There is no graph coming at it from the right, so it does not exist. So if somebody were to just say to you, what is the limit as x approaches 1, you would have to say does not exist because they have to match. All right, next one. So as I'm approaching two from the left, I can't, so it does not exist. As I'm approaching two from the right, I expect the y value to be at one. They don't match, so it does not exist. F of three, as I'm approaching from the left, it looks like it's gonna hit two. As it approaches from the right, it looks like it's gonna hit two they match. So it does have a limit, which makes sense because it's continuous. All continuous functions are going to have limits. As I approach four, this is an interesting one. As I approach four from the left, I'm heading towards one. But as I'm approaching from the right, I'm heading towards zero. They don't match, so it does not exist. It actually doesn't matter that that black dot is there um, as its actual function value. Because these two don't match, um, that's why the limit does not exist. Okay, for the last one. As I'm approaching 5 from the left, it looks like I'm going to hit 1. I can't approach from the right. There's no graph there. And so there's no answer. Okay. So a limit, this is at the top of your next page, a limit is the value of the function we approach as we near a particular x from either the left or the right. The limit is not necessarily the y value. We saw that right here. Okay, it is not necessarily the y value. Um, okay. There are four strategies for finding limits. These are so important to me. These will be quiz questions. What are the four strategies for finding? I mean, I, I want you to really be thinking about it. The first one is just to substitute in, like finding a y value. If you can find the y value and you know it's a continuous function, just find the limit. The limit is the y value. Um, sometimes you can't do that and you have to simplify it first. If you really can't figure it out, make a graph and look at it. And we will learn how to do it making a table of values as well. All right, so the first three. I, you're going to find this out all year long. I'm always going to be thinking about the graph. I think to myself, oh, this is a parabola that's been moved up one. So it's definitely going to have a limit, and it's just going to be whatever the y value is. So using strategy number one, um, 2 squared is 4. 4 plus 1 is Five. So just be thinking about what's happening. They're saying it two. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. As you approach from the left to the right, it's going to be five. The next one is just a line. It's a line. It's continuous. You can just plug it in. So three times negative one is negative three. Negative three minus two is negative five. This one is a rational function, but think about it. Its vertical asymptote is at x is equal to 0. So it has an asymptote here. It also has, because the top has a higher power than the bottom, it also has an oblique asymptote of some kind. I don't even care what this asymptote is. All I know is that the only place where this is going to have a limit problem, by the way, this is not necessarily the exact graph. The concept, though, is the only place where there's going to be a limit problem is at zero, but I'm approaching three. 
So it's definitely going to be continuous at three. So what's strategy number one? Plug it in. Three squared plus one is 10 over two times three is six. So it's going to be five thirds. Did you have to make the graph in order to do this or could you have just simplify or done step number one and substitute it in? Yes, you can just do step number one. But the more you're thinking, the more you're graphing and understanding what's happening, the more the harder problems will be able to do. So I'm constantly going to be reminding you about what the different graphs look like. All right, here's a graph that we did not review in the graphing section. Um, this is a step graph. It is called the greatest integer function. And I think I taught it to you as the birthday function. So remember that when you are zero years old, you're zero, and you have to stay zero. You do not get to say you are a one-year-old literally until right on your first birthday. And then you get to jump up and be a one-year-old. And then you stay a one-year-old all the way until your second birthday. And then you get to jump up and be a two-year-old. And you stay a two-year-old. I mean, people might say I'm two and a half, but if somebody's, you know, asks you for one number your age, you're going to say you're two all the way literally until the very last second, and then you jump up. So this is our step graph. Piece, it's a, called the greatest integer function. Greatest integer function. It is often written as I showed you. Every once in a while, you might see it like this because somebody can't get their computer to get the double brackets. And sometimes you'll see it as INT X, which is how your calculator does it. They don't have this fancy double bracket. So all four of these are greatest integer functions. I cannot stress enough, make the graph. This is such a highly missed question on the quiz that I give no partial credit for it if you do not make the graph. you you got to take the time to make the graph. So, and of course, if you're going negative, it doesn't really follow a birthday rule since we don't have negative years of life. But once you've made the first one, then you can just continue to go to make the, the rest of them. So that's how I would do that. Okay. So... As x approaches 1.8, so here I am, I'm at 1.8, right? And where am I? As I come in from the left, I'm at 1. From the right, I'm at 1. It's 1. But on the next one, as x approaches 2, as I come in from the left, I'm at 1. But as I come in from the right, I'm at 2. So that limit does not exist. So as x approaches negative 5, I didn't go that far out. I highly recommend that you go that far out because it'll help you. So it would be better if I had graph paper um, just to make it more accurate. So if I keep going, this one, I know it's getting really bad, isn't it? So one, two, three, four, five. So there it is. I can see what it's doing from the right. This is what it, hold on. It's definitely, it's at, a, it's at an integer. Anything at an integer is going to have the answer does not exist because that's always where a step graph moves from one thing to the next. So the left-hand limit and the right-hand limit will never match. But anytime you're in between integers, like negative 4.1, 1, 2, 3, 4. When you're at this line, think about where you are. You're definitely on a step. And if you are on a step, there's going to be a limit. So why do people get this wrong? Because they don't know what step they're on or what level they're at. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. That's where the drawing comes in. You write negative 4. You have no picture. Don't come crying to me when I don't give you partial credit for it. Okay. Um, okay, so number eight, I realize that a lot of you don't care about the graph. That's okay. Um, 
then just substitute in. The, the bottom line is that strategy number one is just to substitute in. If you substitute it in, you get 9 minus 9 over 3 plus 3 is equal to 0 over 6 is equal to 0. That's the answer. If you were to graph it, though, keep in mind that this one does simplify. x plus 3, x minus 3 over x plus 3. Okay, so it is actually just the line y is equal to x minus 3. And, of course, that is continuous and does have a limit. Okay, so now we try to substitute in. That's always your first strategy. So you put that in. You get 4 minus 6 plus 2 over 4 minus 4. You get 0 over 0. That's not going to work. You can't divide by 0. No matter what the top would come out to be, you can't divide by 0. So instead, I'm going to rewrite it. Make sure your work is accurate. Um, like you keep writing the word limit. You can't just write an equal to sign and then factor it. Rewrite the problem. I will be very fussy about notation for your own sake. And now you can simplify. And now we can actually just do the limit as t approaches 2 of this function, t minus 1 over t plus 2. Notice I rewrote the limit. That is important. Um, without that, if I took that away, this limit is not equal to this function. It's equal to the limit of that function. So this notation is important. But now you can go back and just sub just substitute in. So 2 minus 1 over 2 plus 2 is equal to 1 fourth. So do you have to graph it every single time? No. But if you were to graph it, this would have a vertical asymptote at negative 2. A over B is 1. It would have a horizontal asymptote at 1. Um, a y-intercept at negative 1 half. So, um, it must look like this. Why would I do that? To see if it looks like it's going to be right. So at 2, it must have already crossed up and gone to the 1 fourth, which makes sense. So I like to have the graph because it helps me know whether or not I did something correct. Okay, the next one is to see if you remember how to clear complex fractions. People don't enjoy it, but this is calculus now. A lot of the skills that you learned in Algebra 2 and pre-calculus are just going to be expected of you. But it doesn't mean that I won't take the time to reteach it. As usual, you might want to see if you can clear the fractions on your own. Pause the video. See if you can do it. See if you get it right. Um, but then you can turn it back on, and I'll be clearing the fractions for you. Okay, so I personally would... Um, Okay, there's actually two ways to do it. I'll show you both of them. So the easier and more reliable way to do this is to give this a common denominator. 2 plus x, 2 plus x, and then to give this the 2 and the 2. Again, you have to keep writing the limit. So that would give you... 2 minus 2 minus x. Don't forget to distribute that negative to both of them when you distribute the 1. Over 2 times 2 plus x. And all of that is over x. So the reason that we would do that is so that we have a single fraction over a single fraction. The limit as x approaches 0 of this becomes negative x negative x over 2 times 2 plus x. And this is really x over 1, so you can flip and multiply. Let me just fix that x and make it nicer. Um, and you can flip and multiply. Now the x's cancel, and you just get the limit as x approaches 0 of negative 1 over 2 times 2 plus x. Now you can substitute it in. So you're 
your strategy is always to substitute in first, but you can't because you can't have X be equal zero and zero in the denominator. So it's always going to be about simplifying so that you can, you can plug it in. So now when I plug in zero, I get negative one fourth. All right, this is a great method. I teach this to everybody, high level classes, low level classes. But just as an aside, personally, if I were trying to clear this fraction, I will show you a, what I consider to be a shortcut. And that is I multiply the top and the bottom by the least common denominator, which is two and two plus X, two and two plus X. When I distribute it to this, the two plus X is canceled. I just get two. When I distribute it here, the twos cancel and I just get two plus X. So minus two minus X. On the bottom, nothing cancels, so I get 2x times, did I lose my x? Oh no, not yet. Um, 2x times 2 plus x, that gives me negative x over 2x times 2 plus x. The x's cancel, and I get this. Um, some people just like that method better. It gets you the exact same spot. Um, you can choose which way you like to do it. All right. Next one. Um, the question here is whether or not you feel like multiplying out 2 plus x three times or whether or not you actually remember um, how to do binomial distribution. So there's nothing wrong with doing 2 plus x Actually, I would change it. X plus 2 times X plus 2 times X plus 2. But on the outside chance you are actually a really big fan of binomial distribution, you might remember that using Pascal's triangle, it's going to be 1, 3, 3, 1. And this is going to be X to the third, X squared, just an X and then no Xs. And this is going to be no twos, 1, 2 two twos, and then three twos. Um, so I don't know if anybody remembers that, but uh, that's how we did binomial distribution. If you're kind of like, oh, that's too long ago. I don't remember it. And just multiply it out. It doesn't come up that often that you have to remember it, but I teach pre-calculus, so I do it all the time. So x cubed plus 6x squared plus 4 times 3 is 12x plus 8, and then don't forget this minus 8 it has to go back in the problem. Minus 8 all over x is equal to x cubed plus 6x squared plus 12x over x. I take out the x, x squared plus 6x plus 12 over x, these cancel. And now I can do the limit as x approaches zero of that function, x squared plus six x plus 12. And when you plug a zero in, you just get 12, which is the answer. If you were to graph this on your graphing calculator, then you would also find that to be the answer. Um, so, sorry, honors calculus, sometimes I will be making a little comment for AP, but it still could hold true for you if you take college calculus. And that is, um, everybody on the AP test, they will, even if you do this problem just like this, you'll get full credit for doing it right, but then you will lose a point for what they call um, a presentation error, which means you didn't show your work properly. This limit is not equal to this function. It's equal to the limit of this function. And that's what I was trying to say above when I kept writing the limit. I want you to see how easy it is to accidentally take that out because you know you're not going to use it yet. So it's just annoying to have to write. But, you know, if you're working on a problem and you do this gorgeous problem and work really hard at it and then you lose a point because you didn't keep writing the word limit, that's just going to stink. So that's called a presentation error. 
um, make sure that you put that in there. All right, so I'm gonna stop there for right now. I know there's just a little bit left, um, but we'll call this part one and I will do part two on another one so you can give yourself a little break there. All right, see you in a few.